uh, Senator Mason, Representative Lucchini, and honorable members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. Um, Senator Justin Schnett, representing Saco, Old Orchard Beach, Hollis, Lemington, and Buxton. And I'm here today to present LD 413. This year marks the seventh anniversary of Citizens United, the catastrophic decision by the United States Supreme Court that declared money is speech, and in doing so, exposed our politics to a deluge of special interests and lobbyist cash. Citizens United told the wealthiest people and the biggest corporations that politics could be their plaything, that democracy could be bought for the right price. By removing any limits on the amount of money that could be spent on elections, that decision put our politics on sale to the highest bidder. Make no mistake, corporations, lobbyists, and super PACs don't donate out of the charitable goodness of their hearts. They don't give millions of dollars because they're friends with the politicians whose pockets they line. They do it because they believe it will buy them access, influence, and perhaps a vote. This isn't a problem just in Washington, D.C., however. Here in Maine, between 2014 and 2015, more than 400 companies hired 229 lobbyists and spent nearly $5 million to lobby state legislators. That's insane, but that dollar amount pales in comparison to the amount of financial contributions that flows from these same lobbyists and the groups that hire them directly to legislators' political action committees and campaigns. We have a system today at the State House that's fundamentally rigged against the average mayor. The lobbyist and special interest group with the largest checkbook has the most direct influence over public policy decision making in our state. It doesn't surprise me that the public has waning faith in our democratic institutions when lawmakers, for instance, who sit on the Energy, Utilities, and Technology Committee, who oversees telecommunications regulations, can accept money from companies such as AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, and Time Warner Cable. If that's not a direct conflict of interest, I don't know what would be. Legislators today are allowed to take money through their PACs and campaign committees from the very industries they're supposed to be regulating. Whether these contributions cause lawmakers to vote in the lobbyist's favor or not, their very existence creates a cloud of uncertainty around the legislative process. They create an appearance of corruption that undermines our democratic institutions. Even though it's not statutorily unethical, there is no doubt of its questionable practices and should raise major red flags. The idea that our political leaders can be financially influenced adds fuel to the fires of distrust in government and casts doubt on whether our elected officials really have our back. It creates unnecessary questions about whose interests they are supposed to be representing in the legislative process. Between 2015 and 2016, almost 40 political action committees were operated by legislators. A Portland Press Herald article from July of last year, which you'll see in your packets, cited the top 15 contributors to those legislator-led PACs. Lobbying firms, multinational pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies, banks, casinos, and the gas industry are just a few on that list. This represents hundreds of thousands of dollars directly to legislators to try to sway policy favorable in their direction. The public doesn't and can't afford lobbyists. We legislators are supposed to be the people's lobbyists. To restore public trust, legislators should be banned from accepting contributions from lobbyists, which is why I've introduced an act to limit the influence of lobbyists by expanding the prohibition on accepting political contributions to do just that. Currently, lobbyists can give legislators contributions right up to the opening bell of the legislative session and immediately upon adjournment. This in-session ban is not adequate. Fundraisers for various PACs and campaign committees of legislators are packed immediately before session starts and immediately following session. <coughs> I've attached an article of this type of scenario running rampant in the state of Connecticut, and it's not much different here. You've probably yourselves had had some inboxes filled, like I have, with invitations for various fundraisers in the weeks and months leading to session and immediately following. The influence and potential conflicts of interest from this influx of money is already felt. It's like we purposely left a major loophole right in the law itself. Does it really matter when that money is dumped into the legislator's account? We should be concerned about this type of activity regardless of whether it occurs when we are officially under this dome or back home in our districts. This bill simply seeks to expand the lobbyist ban on political contributions for the entire year, preventing undue influence on our state officials, from our legislators, to the governor himself. 
According to the National Conference of State Legislatures, a total of six states, Alaska, Tennessee, California, Connecticut, Kentucky, and South Carolina, all have various bans on lobbyist contributions year-round. South Carolina has what many ethics organizations, including the Campaign Legal Center, believe is the model law. The language provided in the bill before you seeks to capture the essence of that law where sitting lawmakers cannot accept contributions from special interest groups and lobbyists. This would not prevent, however, contributions to political parties, caucus PACs, and politically focused nonprofit organizations. So there would still be an outlet for free speech and expression and a way to use financial resources for political influence elsewhere. This bill simply seeks to take lawmakers out of the equation and allow us to focus on the good work at hand. This bill builds upon the successful legislation I co-sponsored last session that closed a loophole in the clean election system that allowed clean election candidates to operate and fundraise through political action committees. The fact that we were able to close that loophole with bipartisan support demonstrate that the renewed public pressure and the national debate over money and politics is really making a difference here in Maine. This committee did great work around campaign finance with Representative Lucchini's leadership and others around this horseshoe that were on the committee last year. Reforming this system takes time and political courage, but I know this committee is up for the task. Together, we can make incremental reforms to our campaign finance system here in Maine to fundamentally restore our sense of trust and credibility back in the institution of government. Thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.